Hello everybody, it's me Kenneth and I am here with Scott Mandelka. Scott is uh, a man of many interests um, and um, as with the guests on, on my show, you know, uh, they always have many interests. But Scott is, um, first of all, he has a PhD in East-West Psychology, a BA in Buddhist Studies and an MA in Counseling. Uh, he is the author for, of three uh, books from elsewhere, Being E.T. in America, Universal Vision, Soul Evolution and Cosmic Plan, and the third book of his is a uh, compilation of his uh, selected essays. Now, Scott is a uh, student of the Law of One. He also teaches from the Law of One, and he combines this with his extensive experience in the Eastern traditions of uh, Buddhism, Taoism, um, and Advaita as well. So, Scott, welcome. Yeah, thank you very much, Ken. Scott, let's, uh, you know, obviously with uh, so much that you know, let's kind of hone the topic down a little bit in this interview. And what I really like to talk to you about is the law of one. And I'm, I'm first of all, I'm very uh, attracted to you in terms of your teachings because you talk about the Eastern traditions and the, uh, the ET uh, stuff uh, uh, together and you, you manage to tie them both together. And that's something that I, I uh, haven't seen done with a lot of teachers, obviously, you know, because people talk about ETs, don't talk about the spiritual stuff, the non-dual right. stuff. People talk about the non-dual stuff, don't talk about the ET stuff at all. Yep. Um, and uh, I actually got a lot out of your interview on YouTube where you said that uh, a lot of the ancient traditions were actually... Uh, uh, had origins in um, extraterrestrial uh, uh, origins, so to speak. Uh, like, uh, you know, the, the ancient traditions that we know these days, like uh, the, the Hindu religion, the Buddhist religion, uh, you may, uh, you suspect or you think that they may have ET origins. Is that... Um, not quite. Okay. Uh, I, I mean, I would never say that Buddhism and the primary teachings of Gautama Buddha came from ET transmission. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in, in the history of Hinduism, some yogis were certainly overshadowed by teachers that provided them with some information. Yep. So in Taoism, also, I wouldn't say that there's any direct ET transmission of, of information. Yep. Uh, but, you know, uh, in line with uh, the a timeline of ET Earth contact, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that Ra gave in the four volumes of the Ra, the Law of One series. Mm. Uh, clearly, there is uh, both positive and negative extraterrestrial intervention um, operating through the entirety of human history from the beginning of what is considered Lemuria or um, 60, 75,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's, there's discussion of direct in intervention in Egypt at the time of Akhenaten and in South America some of the earlier traditions and lost cities being related to sun worship that in the beginning um, was benevolent, <laughs> was monotheism um, not negative as mm. it out. Do you want to do you want to just zoom out a little bit and uh, and talk about cycles I think that's a good place to start because um, and I suppose why I said that as well is the, 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 the time frame of reference, right? If you, if you look at the ancient traditions, it's been, say, maximum 5,000, 6,000 years. But if we talk about, you know, what the stuff, uh, the stuff coming up from the Law of One, we're talking about like 75,000 years. So, you know, just to put it in context, the Ra Law of One material is coming from a much broader perspective. Well, so you, yeah. Yeah, sorry, go. It's okay. Um, as a you know, in terms of um, uh, focusing the discussion in the historical, you know, within historical parameters, in the in the teachings of the Law of One or the raw material, they're claiming that they are a sixth density extraterrestrial group that would be considered about two billion years older in development of consciousness than uh, standard awareness or consciousness of Earth humanity. So, Earth humanity is designated as a race of 
primarily third density or third chakra achieved souls, one step up from the animals, but not yet um, in the realms where there's no confusion. Mm. And so they talk about the law of free will as the law of confusion, <laughs> very deep principle, which explains why oh, positive positive beings don't just come down and give us the keys to the kingdom, uh, because there's a certain respect for our own process of moving out of confusion. Mm. But then the timeline basically says that the beginning of third density soul evolution on planet Earth began 75,000 years ago with direct transfer of beings from Mars, that there was a third density human level civilization that had existed a long time on planet Mars, and that they blew off their atmosphere and destroyed their infrastructure, and that the bulk of the souls were then transferred to Earth. Uh, by you know, interplanetary reincarnation. Mm -hmm. So so the timeline starts about 75,000 years ago and their view is that there are three, the, the 75,000 years in that view is the master cycle of 3D evolution in the galaxy. Yeah. Souls that are out of the animal and plant kingdom in the human level of self-consciousness have 75,000 years uh, divided into three cycles of 25,000 years, which correlate exactly with the equinox, the precession of the equinox, the rotation or movement around the 12 constellations. Yep. And after three of those major cycles uh, becoming total 75,000 years, then there is the beginning of the next dimensional, a higher dimensional cycle on such a planet. And so the meaning of the present time on Earth is that we're ending the 3D cycle and beginning the fourth mm. and fourth dimensional uh, civilization on planet Earth, which has never happened before on planet Earth. Yeah. Now, so <clears throat> their view is then that there's been persistent positive and negative ET contact with humans from the beginning, 75,000 years ago, and that it's intensified in the last 5,000 years. Mm. So. Oh, the contact with Akhenaten in Egypt is about, you know, 3,500 uh, years ago. And that was the major intervention of Ra as representative of a confederation of benevolent planets and groups in the last uh, 10,000 years. But that there was contact in Atlantis and before that too. Okay. Uh, so Scott, we, you've talked about contact, and a lot of people listening are going to ask, how do you know that's contact? How would you answer that? Well, how do you know you're not dreaming right now? You don't know, actually. Your senses give you some information. How do you know that's reliable? You don't know. <laughs> so, you know, it gets back to questions of um, epistemology and how do we know what we believe we do know. Now, uh, there is a difference between psychosis and uh, paranormal experience. And so there's a Sufi saying that the, uh, the enlightened man or being, the adept, swims in the same waters in which the crazy man drowns. And these are considered waters of multidimensional awareness and uh, emptiness of the sense of separation unity, multidimensional, uh, beyond, you know, awareness uh, of, of life that's beyond the visible. Mm. How do we know that's true? There's no proof. And even in the raw material, they address that whole issue and they say, we only offer truth without proof. <laughs> and so, how do you know? You don't know. But all I would say is that oh, truth and uh, authentic, authentic, um, non-delusional <laughs> paranormal experience has a certain quality. Mm. It has a certain mm. feel and taste and sense that's left on the mind. Mm. It's the same mm. idea, how do you know the difference between a dream and an authentic out-of-body experience in which consciousness inhabits a finer body and is considered then on a, a non-physical dimension? Mm. How do you know? Was it my dream, imagination, or was it simply, you know, or was it uh, an authentic uh, remembrance of out-of-body experience? 
you don't know, except that um, both either type of experience leaves a different effect on the mind, mm -hmm. and it's only a very quiet, uh, sensitive mind that can know that. Right. And so, I would never say, you know, I'm offering absolute truth, but I would say. Um, if you really are sensitive to inner knowing, you will recognize that uh, paranormal, multidimensional experience has a different feeling than imagination or delusion. Mm. So I guess your advice would be, I, I mean, obviously most of the people listening to this uh, would be able to understand you in what you're saying. So I guess your advice would be trust your experience and assume you're not going crazy. <laughs> No, I wouldn't. Well, you know, the the real crazy is a person who doesn't know they're crazy. <laughs> so, the, the real insanity is a condition of believing one is for perfectly sane uh while uh in many ways becoming dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. There are certain parameters that that are um observed with a healthy person. Mm -hmm. Healthy, whatever that means, yep. meaning not insane. And that's, you know, the capacity for uh, authentic relationship, the capacity for critical thought, mm. the capacity for logical analysis and recognizing when there's consistency and non consistency in the belief system, mm. belief patterns. So uh, when those things are not present, then there's more, um, there's more evidence for a form of psychosis. But, but again, you know, it's a very subtle matter. Uh, and I would just say, look within. Mm -hmm. if, you want, if you've had some powerful experience that you wonder is genuine, paranormal, or my imagination, or my crazy thought, I would say, be quiet, <laughs> and look within, and feel, and get a sense of, you know, is this a, a fantasy that I want? Is this does this have the coloration of something that I really that I've embellished that I'm embellishing because of my desire for a certain uh, experience, or does it really seem um, in actually objective and and in a way impersonal? The the impersonal like you and I are talking now, yep. you know, there's a certain impersonality to it where. Uh, I don't. I can't imagine. I'm really making it all up. Yeah. Do you want to? So, do you want to talk a little bit about? I guess. The, okay. You know, like uh, Eric von Daniken's work with Chariot of the Gods. I guess that's where where I was uh, steering this conversation towards. Do you want to talk about? You know, the Nazca lines. I mean, in terms of evidence, if people want to go and, you know, investigate that, do you think that's a you know a good route for looking at the ET phenomena? Um. Well, you know, I personally have not <clears throat> had that much interest in um, researching the facts and figures of historical evidence so as to prove something to myself. Mm. Maybe a bit of introduction to me would be appropriate since I don't know if any of your listeners really know who I am or what I'm, where I'm coming from. Not really. No. So perhaps that would be best at this point, or if you don't mind, I'd like to do Go that. Go for it. Go for it. So, my uh, initial uh, impetus for seeking spirituality was basically suffering, which is very traditional Buddhist. Mm. And uh, living in New York City in the 1970s, uh, I perceived a lot of negativity. Mm. I didn't feel comfortable. I didn't feel I belonged. I also found a uh, great um, insincerity and non-authenticity in the, the leaders, religious leaders and social and political and the university and school, not mm -hmm. university, school and high school and what I was in contact with. So I, I didn't feel um, that I fit into this world, stranger in a strange land. Now, sure, indeed, no doubt, um, one can find psychological issues there. But the the, the pre like uh, alienation or adjustment disorder, people can say. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, a hardline psychologist, psychiatrist, may say that any out-of-body experience is psycho. Any sense that there's an out-of-body is psychosis. 
Mm-hmm. Any sense of no self is um, depersonalization or, or a dissociative process. Any uh, difficulty in society represents some kind of developmental failure in one uh, growing up. So, <clears throat> you know, there's a whole host and a raft of psychopathological explanations mm-hmm. or explanations of psychopathology used to explain and actually wash away any uh, belief in an experience of the reality of multidimensional life, life beyond the physical five senses. So uh, they can't prove that paranormal, seri- uh, paranormal experience is psychopathology, mm. um, and, and I couldn't prove that it's a genuine objective experience. Do you think that paradigm is intentional, as in is it constructed to keep us in that box? Well, I think that, um, you know, there is a politics of ideology. <clears throat> There's a politics of belief systems purported to be uh, reality by those in positions of institutional power, yeah. whether educational or media, uh, academic in the universities, uh, the journals, the news reporting and the politicians and the government and all of that and the religions of course. Mm. So religion has a monopoly on spiritual uh, spiritual paradigm and the psychologists or psychology, psychiatry, medicine, seem, Western medicine, uh, see, seeks to give itself a monopoly on the definition of um, personal health, mental health. Mm. And so uh, there's a very uh, glaringly uh, powerful politics uh, behind all of that mm. and very much uh, influences what will be what is allowed to be said or what would be entertained and what isn't so like J Arnold J Alfred or Arnold Heineck a very famous physicist University of Chicago or Chicago J something J Allen Heineck Mm-hmm. big big time UFO researcher basically was a total skeptic of UFOs and ET and all of that after research he believed came to the conclusion it was real and he was completely ostracized by the academic institutions and the so-called objective science mm-hmm. scientists so uh, for me at a young age in high school um, I had so serious doubts about the uh, this <laughs> the uh, credibility of human beings. Mm. And I also had a great suffering associated with that. And, you know, whatever personal issues and being a teenager in New York City in the 70s, dot, dot, dot. So, but uh, as fate would have it, I encountered Buddhism, uh, Taoism, and Hinduism in high school. So I began reading on my own. In college at 18, I signed up for a course in Buddhist meditation ended up learning Vipassana, Anapanasati, breath mindfulness practice. I've been doing that ever since. Ended up dropping out of college, living in monasteries in the U.S., Thai Theravadan, Korean Zen, Japanese Zen, uh, and I went and lived in Thailand and India for a few months. And and threw myself into uh, Vipassana mindfulness practice as a way of getting rid of my suffering. And of course, in meditation, um, you have to sit and face the mind, face the elements of self. And generally, one has to face all that one doesn't want to face because that's what's been avoided and that's what's still stuck down there. Yep. So then I went into even more suffering, but after years of deep practice, something broke, something changed, there was transformation. And then I went back to college and ended up getting a BA in Buddhist studies and psychology from Naropa Institute, which was started by a Tibetan Buddhist, uh, Rinpoche, Chogyam Trungpa, and that was in the 1980s. Uh, Meanwhile, I began having out-of-body experiences in which um, I actually met my uh, ET, extraterrestrial, higher dimensional soul family. I met my group. And it wasn't anything with grays and no abduction and nothing scary and no laboratory and no promises that you're the chosen one and no commands and no 
you know, special privileged information that only I can bring to save the world. Mm. No, nothing like that. Just profound, uh, profound experience of being loved and understood far, far better than I understand myself. Mm. I was, uh, it was a clear out of body and there, I had many, but the one that was pivotal Basically, there were two things. First of all, there was a wave of tangible love, and I, I was weeping in joy. And uh, then there was the sense that they know me far more than I know myself, and that I know myself as a, a, a tiny, my understanding of myself was a tiny fraction of what I am. Hmm. And that doesn't make me feel like I'm a special guy. It didn't make me feel that I had a great mission. It simply confirmed to me why I felt um, as a stranger in a strange land on planet Earth. Mm. And it also uh, reinforced my understanding of um, Buddhism and, and the Law of One, which I was reading at that time, which are talking about positive and negative extraterrestrials and higher dimensions and wanderers coming from uh, other planets and solar systems, other dimensions. And, uh, you know, the experience of being on a planet which doesn't know love. This is a planet of, uh, you know, the purpose of third density is to learn the ways of love. Earth is a school for souls who have not yet learned to love. Mm. The reason that we have so many problems is because people are not, um, con have not confirmed their um, commitment to benevolence and morality, you know. Morality. Scott, do you, do you just want to briefly talk about the chakra system and, and the densities? Because, I mean, we've made references to the densities, but I'm afraid people are getting lost because they don't understand this, the chakra system and how it relates to evolution. Okay. Well, it's a big issue because yeah, <clears throat> the idea is that the, uh, the intrinsic structure of light is a septonate. The intrinsic vibratory ratios of, of what we call light is naturally divided into the seven colors of the rainbow. Hmm. Light goes into a prism, comes out as seven. The rainbow in the sky is the same colors attributed to a traditional Hindu and Western metaphysical uh, understanding of the seven chakra colors from root, which could be called first chakra, base of the spine, to crown, top of the head. Uh, that seven-fold system of energy centers is deep in, in uh, Hindu, you know, Hindu teaching, Hindu mm. spiritual teaching, predating the Buddha. And in Buddhism, the chakras are not important, but in Hinduism and Taoism, they certainly are. In the teaching of the Law of One, they're also considered important uh, for many reasons. Uh, one of which is that that septonate of seven vibratory levels and colors is associated with seven states of consciousness, which is associated with the seven dimensional schema of each solar system, which is far more than the visible planets and sun, of course. Mm. The solar system is considered a spherical, kind of seven dimensional sort of spherical octave. The octave is basically uh, a unified energy field in which there exists seven primary dimensions. On planet Earth, uh, we see first, second, third dimensional life, which is understood as elemental, first, mineral, plant, animal, second, human, third. And the meaning of the present time on Earth is that planet Earth, schoolhouse Earth, for those who have not yet learned to love, is becoming a school for those who already embrace uh, virtue, love, and benevolence. Hmm. So, uh, the idea is that if you understand the seven chakras, which are states of consciousness, energetic po points of energy, and a nexi of energy points associated with particular qualities of consciousness. Hmm. Nexi of energy points associated with particular qualities of consciousness. Yeah. Now, if you understand all those seven, you will also understand the seven-dimensional system and the seven energy bodies, which is a whole other story. Planets also have energy bodies, and those are called the electromagnetic fields that science hardly understands um, surrounding and interpenetrating the rock body of planet Earth. 
So the idea is that Earth is now activating its fourth body associated with fourth chakra, associated with heart and love and compassion. And that's why all teachings of the New Age that are true are associated with development of love, love and compassion, which mm -hmm. begins with self-love, which is what you know, so many spiritual teachings are about. Love yourself, forgive yourself, um, move into heart chakra consciousness. Mm -hmm. And that's because the planet is moving into fourth dimension. And so uh, the law of one or the raw material presents a very detailed schema of the qualities of consciousness associated with the seven chakras, which uh, are also ways of understanding our own personal evolution mm. in that uh, primarily second and third chakra energy blockages are associated with neurosis mm. and psychosis and emotional conflicts and psychopathology. Psychopathology is the result of second third chakra blockages in that system and the way of healing is the way of releasing or dissolving second third chakra energy blockages mm. that is called therapy <clears throat> that's called healing that's called developing a positive self-image developing consistency in your beliefs and your actions yeah. uh, moving through old trauma and pain mm -hmm. and of moving into love and wisdom and that's the salvation for uh, psychopathology is mm -hmm. the development of love and wisdom in self-honesty in honesty and and being you know genuine with oneself in kindness kindly being honest with oneself mm -hmm. and that is development of fourth and fifth chakra which just so happens to be heart and throat or love wisdom and in Buddhism uh, as you hear the Dalai Lama and others say, the key is wisdom and compassion. Wisdom mm -hmm. and compassion. So, Ra says, know yourself, accept yourself, become the creator. Know yourself, fifth chakra, accept yourself, fourth chakra, become the creator, sixth chakra. So the salvation of dysfunctional psychopathology and human suffering is development of love, wisdom, and um, unity, consciousness which is true balance and includes forgiveness. Mm. Yeah, that, okay, wow, great. <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned forgiveness because I guess a lot of listeners would be listening um, based on my previous work with The Course of Miracles. And, you know, there's a, there's a big dynamic there of the ego and, you know, forgiveness as a tool of um, seeing other people as oneself and thus accepting others unconditionally. Um, do you want to talk about that as it relates to this uh, evolutionary path? Okay, so let me break it down. First of all, you talked about, you used the word ego. Yeah. Then you spoke about the importance of forgiveness as a form of seeing others as oneself. And then you spoke about the, um, the mechanics of unconditional acceptance. Mm. Now, in... <laughs> Sorry, I live in the ghetto. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, so, <clears throat> uh, according to the view of the raw material, which is actually the same in this count as the Buddhist teaching of no self, mm. um, according to Ra, the term ego is a concept which is unworkable and understanding cannot come from it. Mm. In the understanding of uh, true nature in Buddhism, there's a recognition of no self, anatta, anatta. Anatta means no atta, no atman. In, in this case, it really means the sense of separate self is an illusion. Mm. There is body, there is mind, there is a karmic stream of thought and feeling and uh, belief and tendency, but that is not a self. That is a karmic stream associated with a body, mind, spirit, energy system, mm -hmm. which is what we call ourselves. So Ra says body, mind, spirit, or mind, body, spirit complex, mm. not a person, and surely not ego. And so you say the closest they can find uh, in, in the body, mind, spirit complex to what we call ego uh, is third chakra blockage. Mm. Third chakra blockage is associated with a conflict in, in the relationship between self and others and self and group and society. Conflict in relationship 
um, is very much associated with uh, conflicts related to the sense of self. And that's uh, what they're, they're saying is an ego. The only thing uh, that they can see in us that resembles what we're calling ego is third chakra blockage associated with um, low self-valuation and uh, conflict in true relationship mm. as to how to make you know true relationship, which is <laughs> love and wisdom. And so, personally, I myself never use the word ego, mm. and I know there isn't a such a thing. So, mm. I mean, I've sat in meditation, and I've seen that, you know, self is a thought. In the early days, I could see that self is a thought. It doesn't mean there aren't tendencies. It doesn't mean I have no blockages. It just means that the experience of a separated selfhood is based on limited perception and doesn't actually pertain to the reality of what we are. Right, it's a construct. It's a construct, just as Ross said, it's a concept. Mm. And they said understanding, which is a quality of heart chakra activation, and that's a little um, seed principle. Uh, development of understanding is the development of heart chakra. Love and understanding go together. Mm. And it's not native to the third density mind, meaning we need to do work to develop understanding. Ra even said, understanding is not of your density. Understanding is not of your density, meaning it's not native to the mind we're using in the body we have that we have full understanding of anything. Number one. So, uh, I discard the use of the word ego and I know it's a fantasy. So, and Ra, it's in line with Buddhism and Ra and that's good enough for me too. Mm -hmm. And my own experience. So then, the, the development of forgiveness is, in my view, personally, I've done counseling for 20 years with people. I have an MA in counseling and PhD in East-West psychology. Uh, from my experience with people uh, and my understanding of the seven chakra system, true forgiveness is actually uh, only, only possible with a very significant development of uh, unconditional acceptance, love, and clarity, discernment, understanding, wisdom. So this is associated with six chakra. Six chakra, third eye, the brow chakra, ajna center, the center of the forehead, is associated with experience of oneness, and peace, and true spiritual empowerment, and forgiveness. And so forgiveness requires not only unconditional acceptance, as you say, Unconditional acceptance is a quality of fourth ray, fourth chakra. But also a, a somewhat deep understanding that realizes mutual responsibility. Mm. That um, even though you, you said those things that I found hurtful, you know, or you lied or broke your promises, which means, you know, that's not virtuous action, sure, uh, I agreed to be in relationship with you. Mm. If, if, if something happens to us, it's co-created, even if it's the responsibility of the other that is the primary um, initiator of the situation. Even if they initiate and do some action which is not virtuous and we feel so hurt, we have already chosen to be there with them. <laughs> if it's not related to you, it won't be in your life. Mm -hmm. If it's in your life, it's co-created by you. Right. And so. I don't think forgiveness is that easy. <clears throat> I don't think I don't think people should bandy about the term forgiveness whatsoever. Forgiveness is a great achievement, and forgiveness takes not only unconditional acceptance of my pain, your pain, my feelings, your feelings, and all the dynamics, but a clear understanding of how this all came to be. How did it come to be that you did that, or they did that, or didn't do that, or whatever it is? How did it come to be that I am here with you? How did it come to be that I chose this? What could I be learning from it? How did I co-create it? What is the value? What can I learn here? How can I grow here? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, all of that being considered, then I think we can talk about forgiveness. Mm -hmm. But being a sixth density affair, forgiveness, in my view, it is very much associated with seeing other as uh, oneself, yeah. meaning an awareness of one, a oneness. Mm -hmm. And in the raw material, they don't use the word other, ever. They use the term other self. Hmm. Imla Kesh, I am another you. Same as the uh, Mayan. 
So Yimla Kesh means I am another you. And that is the same as saying there's self and other self, because there's only the one self or the one life that is um, identity. And that's the law of one. And that's realized in six chakra. But that doesn't happen in a stable way until well-developed love acceptance and wisdom understanding. Mm. So that's very simple. It's very straightforward. The way to six is through four and five. None come to the Father but through the Christ principle, which is really love wisdom. And that's the essence of higher self or our true being, which is not a self also, because it's, it's an awareness, it's a focalization of love, wisdom, consciousness of one uh, without a sense of separation from all that is. But that's not the end of the way, and uh, what we call Buddha is actually considered one step above higher self, which is the same as Bodhisattva. Bodhisattva in Buddhism is the, the perfect blend of love, wisdom, which mm. leads to peace and forgiveness and true empowerment and balance, mm. and that's a great achievement. So I think forgiveness is where it's at for sure, but it's the distillate of a long series of inner workings, uh, seeking to accept fully, seeking to know more deeply. Mm. And I wanted to ask you as well about unity consciousness, because certainly what we're talking about here is that unity consciousness, unity consciousness only really occurs at six uh, density, and. It could be my misperception, but in New Age circles, you know, it's often talked about uh, Earth moving to a fourth dimension or fourth density, and that's unity consciousness. So, I guess, would you, what, what would you say on that? Well, love consciousness is dualistic. There's me, there's you, and there's the experience of love, um, love-based relation. That's called duity, duality. Mm -hmm. That's the awareness of self and other self, or self and other, actually. And so, that experience of me and you and the uh, quality of the relationship based on love and acceptance is wholly, thoroughly, totally dualistic. Mm. And unity consciousness is not. Ne? That's Japanese. So, yeah, it's very clear to me. I mean, love is dualistic. Mm. However, love is the gateway to the experience of unity. There's no true right. experience of unity without without unconditional, vast and wide and far-reaching unconditional acceptance. Yes. Unconditional acceptance of our shadow, unconditional acceptance of evil on earth, of what we call injustice, of uh, terrible suffering, of grotesque and horrible uh, human mind and human activity and behavior on planet earth, mm -hmm. and, and uh, unconditional acceptance of you know, the the one infinite creation which allows all that to be. Mm. You know? Why? You know, a lot of a lot of humans have had the problem with the issue of uh, a benevolent God or creator and the presence of evil and injustice. Of course they don't realize multi incarnational soul evolution. They don't realize that uh, there is multi incarnational karma, meaning mm. incarnation. Right? There really is reincarnation, mm. and there really is a karmic flow of cause and effect. And you plant a good seed, you get a good fruit. You plant a bad seed, you get a bad fruit. It's much more subtle than that. But oh, not seeing beyond a single lifetime, we experience uh, injustice. We believe we see injustice. Uh, yes, indeed, there's a lot of suffering. Mm. But I, I, what I would say is, although you can say the infinite creator is infinite love. That infinite love uh, operates by um, extremely um, high, highly impeccable respect for free will. Mm -hmm. That impeccable respect for free will <clears throat> is the uh, exquisite subtlety and complexity of karma. And that's multi-incarnational. And that's even multi-dimensional. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when we see suffering and injustice, the suffering is quite real, uh, but the injustice um, is because we don't perceive the big picture, which is that these are beings who've had past lives, and they're, they're eternal beings on a course of total development, and there's a lot more going on than one single incarnation. Yeah. 
Now, my, my understanding of this uh, concept of suffering from the law of one, and please correct me if I'm getting this wrong, is that it's a, it's a method of um, polarization, that it, that it um, sort of accelerates the polarization of uh, a mind-body complex, spirit complex, into either service to self or service to others in the third density. Um, what would you say with this concept of suffering and the third density and the move to fourth? Okay. So, the the evolutionary um, schema again that Ra offers is in line with a deeper reading of um, Hinduism and esoteric Buddhism, mm -hmm. in which, particularly in Buddhism, there's a discussion of six realms, six worlds, or six levels of being. The top two are called the devas and the asuras. Deva, Sanskrit meaning shining, radiant one, which is the same as positive ETs or the angelics. Then there's the Ashuras, higher dimensional, jealous, fighting, angry gods. Same as negative extraterrestrials. Mm. <clears throat> Hinduism has the same schema of the higher, so-called higher dimensions, polarity, cosmic polarity. The lower realms are hell, animals, and hungry ghosts, and then there's human in the middle. Now, <clears throat> uh, in that view from Ra, <clears throat> there's the idea that the purpose of third density is actually to make spiritual choice and go on one of the two paths called service to other, service to self. Mm -hmm. One is the positive, the common, normal, ordinary, positive spiritual path, which is service to other, based in love. It's also called the path of unity. <clears throat> so the values of that path are love and honesty and benefit for all. Mm -hmm. So it's not just mm -hmm. service to others and forgetting oneself. It's, um, it's love, wisdom uh, as the basis for all decision. Mm -hmm. and all, all choice and then the purpose of third density is to make a clear choice the other option is service to self which only Ross said only 10% of the souls that get out of 3D in the universe which are you know everywhere going out of 3D 10% go service to self 90% go service to other mm -hmm. so that explains positive and negative ETs that explains positive and negative ET contact and the different types which are quite different Mm. So, <clears throat> to uh, spur on, to intensify the spiritual seeking or inner seeking, it's really a seeking of meaning and value. The, the seeking of meaning and value to one's life. What do I really feel is important? And what's the, what's the meaning of this? And, and what's really important for me? Mm. That determination leads to polarization. That polarization is a choice between path of unity and the path of separation and control, positive and negative. Now, various forms of what Ra calls catalyst are then both programmed before birth as well as the result of choices during the life. These forms of catalyst include suffering, <clears throat> such as illness, sickness. Some people are born and they're sickly from day one, right? Sickly ch children who die young or live as, you know, with a weak body all their life. That's one type of suffering catalyst chosen before birth, according to this view. <clears throat> Likewise, you know, if you're born in uh, Bosnia, you know, Herzegovina, if you're born in a war zone, if you're born in certain conditions, you have either opportunity, which is harmonious, or you have hardship and challenge, which is disharmonious. Both are forms of catalyst. Mm -hmm. And so all life experience can be understood as catalyst. And the efficient use of catalyst, meaning uh, making use of our life to learn and grow, mm -hmm. is, uh, requires reflection and um, inquiry, self-inquiry, self and the determination of meaning and value. And so it's a moral issue, you know. Do I really consider that... <clears throat> the benefit of all is good for me? Or do I really feel that whatever it takes to get more power than others is best for me? That's mm. positive or negative. So suffering is a primary or a major type of catalyst uh, in 3D that can be used by souls to get themselves together <laughs> and make a clear choice of their values and move on to one or the other path. Unfortunately, what's happened with this group of souls on planet Earth is that uh, by non-loving decisions, which uh, lead to non-loving action, which leads to harm, 
uh, what's called negative karma or a karmic liability is established. That mm -hmm. then requires some kind of karmic rebalancing, which is generally the simple rule, <clears throat> you know, if you hurt others, uh, hurts coming on in at you. Mm -hmm. What you do to the world is what the world does to you. What you give out is what comes in, what goes around comes around. Mm -hmm. Create your own reality, the law of attraction, it's the secret, but not really a secret. It's the law of karma, mm. not a secret at all. Mm. The, law's, the secret is that there's no secret. It was the law of karma understood 5,000 years ago, and understood in Atlantis, and understood in other worlds. Mm. It's called karma. But actually, humans don't understand it. And so, there's the sense of, this suffering is unfair. It's mm. unfair. It's, I don't deserve this. Well, yes, you do. You don't deserve it in some cases, right? I mean, I'm walking down the street and somebody runs over my toe. You can say you don't deserve it, but you're choosing to be walking down that street. Your responsibility is walking on the street. Maybe that's, you know, doesn't seem like it deserves <laughs> to be have your toe run over, <laughs> and it doesn't. It doesn't, right. However, however, there's a higher level of, of life that uh, we don't see. Hmm. And... Uh, there's a purpose to life mm. that's far more profound than what we're told mm. by religion and certainly by media or human you know, so-called leadership. So the, the significance of human life is far more than uh, you know, make a good material life for yourself and your friends and your family mm. or get ahead or get some stuff. I mean, the purpose of human life is the development of all we are. Mm. Ra said, the, the purpose of incarnation is the development of mind, body, spirit. Mm. So simple. The purpose of incarnation is the development or evolution of mind, body, spirit. So, <coughs> so that, again, just to, to close that, in that bigger view of mm. the significance of our incarnation and all the strange things that happen to us, some of which seem completely unfair, mm. Nevertheless, even if we didn't do anything, at some level we agreed to, at a higher level, we agreed to be here for it, and we agreed to participate, uh, not because we deserve pain or suffering, in, in some cases, I mean, in some cases we do, <laughs> because pain out is pain in, you know, abuse out is abuse coming in, what mm. goes around comes around, but not in all cases. In the cases where it seems, you know, what did I do, and even if there's nothing, it seems uh, of course, we don't see past lives, you know, so we don't know anything anyway. But in the cases that seem quite obviously unfair, what is fair is that we're here for accelerated soul evolution. Mm -hmm. And all sorts of trouble and suffering can be used that way too. Mm. Now, we, we haven't talked about the higher self and all this, and, and you know, obviously with this concept of uh, seemingly unjust things happening to you and people seeming to attack you you know personally I, I always appeal to spirit or the higher self to uh, help me with that do you want to just talk about the role of the higher self well the higher self is um, our true being it's considered a being um, in its own right like a master Mm. that has projected a portion of its consciousness and life force into the vehicles of mind-body-spirit complex. Mm. So <clears throat> there's considered, a, in, in the theosophy of Alice Bailey, in Western metaphysics, which that system has some other problems, but regardless of that, um, they talk about two um, streams, two, two lines of contact between the incarnate self and what they call the monad. Monad actually is the same as higher self. There's the life stream and the consciousness stream. Mm -hmm. And one goes into the heart and one goes into the brain, uh, whatever. But uh, we are in many ways what in Tibetan Buddhism is called an emanation body. We are an emanation body mm -hmm. of the bodhisattva of higher self which is a being in its own right in sixth density, late 60, it's actually 6.6 .6 or so. Mm. So, <clears throat> meaning if we divide dimensions into seven subplanes, it's very, very workable. So, uh, higher self then knows the path back to itself. Mm. It knows the energy consciousness requirements for uh, st 
steady progression up through dimensional levels back to late six. Mm. And so the higher self has its own life and its own thing to do. But it, uh, in my understanding, is sort of the oversoul uh, primary teacher guide for the evolution of a soul, which is not the same, through time and space and multiple dimensions, one after another. Earth is in three. We don't jump to five. That's another New Age fallacy. We're moving into the next level, which is heart. Mm -hmm. Humans barely know love. You think they're going to move into fifth chakra? Wisdom? I don't think so. So, higher self is really um, your uh, your being that lives at one with all. Mm. Your being that lives in peace. Your being that is replete with will. Your being that has great forgiveness available. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't blame, so it's beyond that process. But it's 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 the peace that comes from profound acceptance and profound understanding that is forgiveness. Forgiveness is, a, is an integration of profound acceptance and profound understanding. Mm. That is the mind of higher self. Mm. That is the condition of six chakra. Would you it's say... developed by meditation, uh, but that itself doesn't do the work of clearing the lower two. Mm. That's all another story. Yeah, well, Scott, I mean... Okay, this so the um, the higher self. Uh, would you say it, it it exists right at the cusp of disappearing into uh, the creator? Yeah. That the, you know the higher self in in sense still has an identity that it's still hanging on to in order to help the lower self. Um, well, the higher self has its own life aside from from helping the manifest mind body spirit complex. Mm -hmm. It has its own. It's got its own gig, you know, not simply uh, waiting for us to, to call for assistance. Right. But um, the distinction between sixth and seventh density life or being is the distinction between sixth or seventh chakras. Um, in the system that Ra gives, they talk about the, the, quali the law, L-A-W, the laws associated with each of the dimensional levels, mm -hmm. which correlate the chakras. So... Sixth dimension is the law of one. Ra says they're in late 60, higher self is late 60, Bodhisattva is late is a higher self, and that's the law of one, experience of one. One is all, all is one. Hmm. Now, the next step up, if we say up, or bigger, or greater, is uh, seventh density, which is called the law of forever. And Ra said at that level, the looking backwards is finished. The looking backwards is finished. There's no more interest or action of uh, awareness of more uh, separative consciousness at so-called lower dimensional levels. Mm. And, and so likewise in meditation, when there's authentic crown chakra activation, one is in bliss, totally wordless, uh, bliss, mystery, the in, ineffable, uh, ineffable experience of fusion in fatality, which is joyous, uh, but has very has really nothing to say, <laughs> mm. and so it's actually the step beyond unity. And in Buddhism, there is no discussion of unity. The original teaching of Buddhism is not the same as Hinduism, talking about you know God consciousness or unity, one with all. Uh, the Buddha basically didn't explain what nibbana, nirvana, complete and perfect enlightenment is but that it's freedom from, it's the destruction of ignorance and freedom from all suffering and freedom from all um, becoming. Mm. No becoming. And that's akin to seventh density, mm. which is the end of uh, separative action for soul evolution. There, there's no more uh, path. The path is over. And uh, there's dissolution of one's essential being which is the sixth density, mm. the, the dissolution of that essential unified being into totality, into infinity. One mm. becomes infinity. So would you, say at this, would you say at this level space-time no longer exists? Oh yeah, space-time doesn't exist in, at the level of higher self. Mm. Now space-time 
is a product of dualistic consciousness. Mm. There is no space-time for those who've transcended attachment to the belief in consciousness. Mm. The Buddha actually said there were, uh, they're considered five skandhas. Skandhas are heaps, H-E-A-P-S, heaps. These skandhas or heaps are what we experience that then deem to be an ego. Mm. The sense of self, the sense of ego is simply a, 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 a uh, is sort of the continuity of a sense of cohesion to the um, continually shifting, changing uh, flow of the skandhas. The skandhas are form, feeling or uh, sensation, perception, uh, mental formations, which means what's also called volitional formations, thought and emotion, and then consciousness. And mm. the Buddha said, even consciousness is born of ignorance. Mm. Even consciousness is born of ignorance because the experience of consciousness is, per se, dualistic, mm. right? I'm conscious of unity. All that designation, the differentiation of an identity and the perception and the uh, object, which is unity, I'm aware of unity, I am one, all of that is dualistic. There's the I in distinction to you, there's being as opposed to non-being, there's unity as opposed to duality, totally dualistic. Mm. And so beyond the belief in separative consciousness is a boundless awareness. Mm. And so some teachers, Nityananda, Nisargadatta, Maharaj, Indian guys, uh, use the terms awareness in distinction to consciousness, saying that when consciousness is, is extinguished, then there's uh, infinite awareness. So there's no end of what we are. It's just a refinement of uh, our awareness, or from from consciousness to uh, unfettered, non-dual awareness. Mm. So uh, that's considered the path, and yes, very much so. Uh, beyond the levels of higher self, there's not much interaction with the human, except um, the raw, raw material talks about an eighth density level, which are basically like lords of karma or guardians to the seven density octave that are assistants to the logos, kind of the helpers of the, of the creator of a seven density octave are eighth density beings that, uh, despite being <laughs> in infinity, uh, can coalesce and make some kind of uh, contribution to guide and manage the seven dimensional octave. Hmm. Now I wanna, I wanna. First of all, Scott, it's been a while. Do you? Uh, are you okay to go on? Yeah, sure, I'm okay. Because I, I, I was actually thinking of covering the wanderer topic, but I was wondering, maybe that's a big topic. You know, maybe we should talk about that in another interview. Um, but I actually wanted to talk about enlightenment, and you know, we, we, we see. Um, you know, I wanted to talk about enlightenment and this kind of concept. Like, okay, so we we are, we're talking about all of this and, and unity consciousness. So, can how 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 is it possible that uh, we see uh, people who seem enlightened but still have a body? And you know, how does that relate to the inner interpenetration of densities? <clears throat> well, first of all, in Buddhism, there are considered four stages of enlightenment. Very few people seem to understand that. The first is called Sotapanna, which is stream entry, and that represents uh, uh, an initial penetration to the nature of reality, which leads to an experience of no self or the, the recognition that self is a dream and our true being is non-separate from all that is. Mm. That's simply the first level of enlightenment <clears throat> in the Buddhist system. Mm. And in that system, uh, only at the level of complete and perfect enlightenment which is the fourth, is there the complete destruction of ignorance and all, <clears throat> all the distortions of uh, grasping, aversion, and unknowing, mm. or believing, believing in illusion. So only at the final stage is uh, there no more distortion in the, in the personality, no more blockage in the second and third chakra. Normally that kind of thing is not done in third density anyway, that, that final transformation is usually done from sixth density mm -hmm. but uh, so a person who's had a first level enlightenment which actually seems to be more rare than than 
than I imagine. It's actually quite rare. Mm -hmm. uh, a person who's had that will still have personal distortions, but they know uh, that self is uh, just a fiction. It's just a concept. Mm -hmm. And so uh, many, you know, enlightenment is a big deal. And yet there's a difference between initial penetration to the nature of reality, which is a awakening, which is an enlightenment, mm -hmm. and the goal, which is they call the complete and perfect enlightenment. And so, in the raw in raw system, they say that this this moment of enlightenment is uh, contact with intelligent infinity, and that means that energy has made a a um, a consistent and unbroken line in consci with consciousness between root and crown. Mm -hmm. And so, in the human body, we can experience moments of uh, totality or we can live there finally, but an enlightenment experience as a discrete experience is a, a penetration uh, of energy through all chakra levels up to the crown seven. And that leads to, you know, so-called God consciousness or intelligent infinity. Mm. Now, that can surely, of course, be done in the human body. And mm. so then there are people who are sotapanna in the human body. In Buddhism, there's also the discussion of enlightenment with remainder, enlightenment without remainder. In that system, the remainder, in the, well now we're talking about guys who are arhats, fourth level, completely finished. They're not Buddhas, but they're, they're just, uh, they don't have the same responsibilities or historical meaning as a Buddha, but they're, the level of consciousness is infinite. They're, they're basically out of consciousness and they're in infinite awareness and they're finished and their next evolution will basically be in eighth density mm -hmm. so for those guys uh... the buddha said that's a state that's considered enlightenment with the remainder the remainder is the human body mm. and there still is karma even though they know the karma is empty and they have no uh... no no conflict resistance or struggle with the experiencing of karma right. but surely complete and perfect enlightenment can be known in the body but there's still the karmic remainder of the body and pattern and certain patterns of mind or things that are going to come in from the environment uh, and it, the without remainder is when that fellow dies and there's no more human body and then they basically cannot be located <laughs> you can't say what happens to them after uh, death in that state and the Buddha refuted all views on that and said you just is, you know, it's pointless to speculate. Just get yourself there, and you'll know. <laughs> Great. Great answer. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, right. So what then is the Buddha? What a uh, Buddha? What's that? What is a Buddha? A Buddha is basically a, um, a focalization of intelligent infinity. Mm. It is a, uh, a manifestation of infinity that is intelligent, operating through the form, the energy, matter, form of a human body mm. in, in the third density world. Mm. I mean, I think Buddhas go to higher density planets, but uh, I haven't experienced that recently. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. so, yeah, so a Buddha, a Buddha is a sun. A Buddha is, is, the, is at the same level of um, a logos, logos as meaning from the Greek word called word. The mm. word in Greek for word is logos. Mm. So that's a metaphysical term for basically uh, a creator of a seven-dimensional solar system who manifests through the physical sun. But, but the, whole, you know, the whole heliosphere of the seven-dimensional octave associated with the solar system is the body, is the manifestation of that great being. Wow. And so a Buddha is at the same level as that. So after you become a Buddha, you can become a solar system. Hey, hey. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Scott, I'm just going to we're just going to start wrapping it up because I think we've we've uh, covered a lot of material actually. Yes. And so. um, you know, actually we we we've uh, I like to think that we've skimmed the surface of of many very important topics and I really like to encourage uh, people, if they're interested in these topics, to go on Scott's website, uh, talkswithscottmandelka.com, 
um, and scottmendelko.com as well. Yeah, let me let me just present the yeah, contact information. So I have um, an archive site, which is www.scottmandelker.com, which is S-C-O-T-T-M-A-N-D-E-L-K-E-R.com. There's a um, site with a lot of free PDF compilations from RAW and certain major writings that I put into PDF form, as well as book three, as well as book four for free in PDF form, and that's uh, not a www, it's an HTTP uh, talks with scottmandelker.com. And then I have a YouTube channel with 133 or so videos. They're really audio, uh, they're, they're audios from my weekly Skype discussion group that's been going on the last couple of years, talking about the PDF, the PDF compilations from the Law of One. Yep. And it's a very comprehensive study and quite advanced. I also do personal counseling in one-hour Skype sessions by voice, and there's information on the Talks with Scott Mandelker site, and uh, there's my email address on all of those for yeah. contact. Yeah. yeah, and I'll I'll put the links on the uh, uh, description page as well for for this YouTube uh, clip. I'm going to make a YouTube clip out of this uh, this podcast. Great, great. So Scott, thank you so much for, for being with us. Any any last things you'd like to mention to our listeners? Um, no, but I think it might be nice to just read a little quote about the Law of One. So, uh, I don't see where the right page is, but the Law of One is basically saying that that our experience of polarity and conflict and duality is is the result of limited perception and that the key to awakening is transformation of perception so that we see what is rather than simply see the interpretations based on our distortions or limited limited awareness limited perception <clears throat> and the purpose of human life is the development of all we are and this is a special time on planet earth with uh, very particular hardships and opportunities. Mm. And um, the strength of the inner light equals the strength of our seeking that light. And so if you wish to be filled with light, light love, love light, um, seek strongly. Seek truth strongly. Love love, love truth, and all is well. <clears throat> so that's my closing benediction. <laughs> Thank you. So it's a serious it's a serious matter, and um, uh, the development of perception is everything. Mm. <clears throat> so Scott, um, love to have you back for another show, um, but let's arrange that off air. So this is um, Scott Manuka and Ken Bach. Uh, hope you enjoyed this little podcast and. Bye last uh, 10,000 years but that there was contact in Atlantis and before that too okay uh, so Scott we, you've talked about contact and a lot of people listening are going to ask how do you know there's contact how would you answer that well how do you know you're not dreaming right now you don't know actually your senses give you some information how do you know that's reliable you don't know so, you know, it gets back to questions of um, epistemology and how do we know what we believe we do know. Now, uh, there is a difference between psychosis and uh, paranormal experience. And so there's a Sufi saying that the, uh, the enlightened man or being, the adept, swims in the same waters in which the crazy man drowns. And these are considered waters of multi-dimensional awareness and uh, emptiness of the sense of separation, unity, multi-dimensional, uh, beyond, you know, awareness uh, of uh, life that's beyond the visible. Mm. How do we know that's true? There's no proof. And even in the raw material, they address that whole issue and they say, we only offer truth without proof. <laughs> and so, how do you know? You don't know. 
But all I would say is that uh, truth and uh, authentic, authentic, um, non-delusional <laughs> paranormal experience has a certain quality. Mm -hmm. It has a certain mm -hmm. feel and taste and sense that's left on the mind. Mm -hmm. It's the same idea. How do you know the difference between a dream and an authentic out-of-body experience in which consciousness inhabits a finer body and is considered then on a, a non-physical dimension? Mm -hmm. How do you know? Was it my dream, imagination, or was it simply, you know, or was it uh, an authentic uh, remembrance of an out-of-body experience? You don't know except that um, both either type of experience leaves a different effect on the mind mm -hmm. and it's only a very quiet uh, sensitive mind that can know that right. and so I would never say you know I'm offering absolute truth but I would say mm -hmm. and so they talk about the law of free will as the law of confusion <laughs> very deep principle which explains why oh, Positive, positive beings don't just come down and give us the keys to the kingdom uh, because there's a certain respect for our own process of moving out of confusion. Mm. But then the timeline basically says that the beginning of third density soul evolution on planet Earth began 75,000 years ago with direct transfer of beings from Mars that there was a third density human level civilization that had existed a long time on planet Mars and that they blew off their atmosphere and destroyed their infrastructure and that the bulk of the souls were then transferred to Earth uh, by you know, interplanetary reincarnation. Mm -hmm. so, so the timeline starts about 75,000 years ago and their view is that there are three, the, the 75,000 years in that view is the master cycle of 3D evolution in the galaxy, yeah. souls that are out of the animal and plant kingdom in the human level of self-consciousness have 75,000 years uh, divided into three cycles of 25,000 years which correlate exactly with the equinox, the precession of the equinox, the rotation or movement around the 12 constellations. Yeah. And after three of those major cycles uh, becoming total 75,000 years, then there is the beginning of the next dimensional, a higher dimensional cycle on such a planet. And so the meaning of the present time on Earth is that we're ending the 3D cycle and beginning the fourth mm -hmm. uh, dimensional uh, civilization on planet Earth, which has never happened before on planet Earth. Yeah. Now, so... <clears throat> Their view is then that there's been persistent positive and negative ET contact with humans from the beginning, 75,000 years ago, and that it's intensified in the last 5,000 years. Mm -hmm. So uh, the contact with Akhenaten in Egypt is about you know 3,500 uh, years ago, and that was the major intervention of Ra as representative of a confederation of benevolent planets and groups in the... Hello everybody, it's me Kenneth and I am here with Scott Mandelker. Scott is uh, a man of many interests um, and um, as with the guests on, on my show, you know, uh, they always have many interests. But Scott is, um, first of all, he has a PhD in East-West Psychology a BA in Buddhist Studies and an MA in Counseling. Uh, he is the author for, of three uh, books from elsewhere, Being ET in America, Universal Vision, Soul Evolution and Cosmic Plan, and the third book of his is a uh, compilation of his uh, selected essays. Now Scott is a uh, student of the Law of One. He also teaches from the Law of One and he combines this with his extensive experience in the Eastern traditions of uh, Buddhism, Taoism, um, and Advaita as well. So, Scott, welcome. Yeah, thank you very much, Ken. Scott, let's, uh, you know, obviously with uh, so much that you know, let's kind of hone the topic down a little bit in this interview. And what I really like to talk to you about is the Law of One. And 
I'm I'm first of all I'm very、uh, attracted to you in terms of your teachings, because you talk about the Eastern traditions and the、uh, the ET uh, stuff uh, uh, together, and you you manage to tie them both together, and that's something that I I、uh, haven't seen done with a lot of teachers, obviously, you know, because. People talk about ETs. Don't talk about the spiritual stuff, the non-dual、right. stuff. People who talk about the non-dual stuff. Don't talk about the ET stuff at all. Yep.、Um, and、uh, I actually got a lot out of your interview on YouTube, where you said that、uh, a lot of the ancient traditions were actually uh, uh, had origins in、um, extraterrestrial uh, uh, origins, so to speak. Uh, like uh, you know the the ancient traditions that we know these days, like、uh, the the Hindu religion, the Buddhist religion,、uh, you may、uh, you suspect or you think that they may have ET origins. Is that、um, not quite okay?、Uh, I I mean I would never say that Buddhism and the primary teachings of Gautama Buddha came from ET transmission.、Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. In in the history of Hinduism, some yogis were certainly overshadowed by teachers that provided them with some information. Yep. So in Taoism, also, I wouldn't say that there's any direct ET transmission of of information. Yeah.、Uh, yeah. But you know,、uh, in line with、uh, the a timeline of ET Earth contact. Yeah. yeah.、Uh, that Ra gave in the four volumes of the Ra the Law of One series.、Mm. Clearly, there is、uh, both positive and negative extraterrestrial intervention、um, operating through the entirety of human history, from the beginning of what is considered Lemuria or sixty, seventy-five thousand years ago.、Mm-hmm. So you know, there's there's discussion of direct in- intervention in Egypt at the time of Akhenaten, and in South America. Some of the earlier traditions and lost cities being related to sun worship that in the beginning、um, was benevolent, <laughs> was monotheism,、uh, not negative.、Mm. Do you want to do you want to just zoom out a little bit and、uh, and talk about cycles? I think that's a good place to start because、um, and I suppose why I said that as well is the the the, the time frame of reference. Right. If you if you look at the ancient traditions, it's been say maximum five thousand, six thousand years. But if we talk about you know what the stuff,、uh, the stuff coming out from the law of one, we're talking about like seventy five thousand years. So you know just to put it in context, the raw law of one material is coming from a much broader perspective. Well,、so、you, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Go. It's okay.、Um, as a you know, in terms of、um, uh, Focusing the discussion in the historical, you know, within historical parameters, in the in the teachings of the Law of One or the raw material, they're claiming that they are a six density extraterrestrial group that would be considered about two billion years older in development of consciousness than、uh, standard awareness or consciousness of Earth humanity. So.、Mm-hmm. Humanity is designated as a race of primarily third density or third chakra achieved souls, one step up from the animals, but not yet、um, in the realms where there's no confusion. They,、um, if you really are sensitive to inner knowing, you will recognize that、uh, paranormal, multi-dimensional experience has a different feeling than imagination or delusion.、Mm. So I guess your advice would be, and I, I mean, obviously, most of the people listening to this、uh, would be able to understand you in what you're saying. So I guess your advice would be trust your experience and assume you're not going crazy. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. Well, you know, the the real crazy is a person who doesn't know they're crazy. <laughs> so the, the real insanity is a condition of believing one is per- perfectly sane. Uh, while, uh, in many ways, becoming dysfunctional,、mm-hmm. there are certain parameters that that are、um, observed with a healthy person.、Mm-hmm. Healthy, whatever that means,、yep. meaning not insane. And that's you know the capacity for、uh, authentic relationship, 
the capacity for critical thought, mm. the capacity for logical analysis and recognizing when there's consistency and non-consistency in belief system, mm. belief patterns. So uh, when those things are not present, then there's more, uh, there's more evidence for a form of psychosis. But, but again, you know, it's a very subtle matter. Uh, and I would just say, look within. If you want, if you've had some powerful experience that you wonder is genuine paranormal or my imagination or my crazy thought, I would say be quiet and look within and feel and get a sense of, you know, is this a, a fantasy that I want? Is this, does this have the coloration of something that I really want, that I've embellished, that I'm embellishing? because of my desire for a certain uh, experience or does it really seem um, in actually objective and and in a way impersonal the, the impersonal like you and I are talking now yep. you know there's a certain impersonality to it where uh, I don't I can't imagine I'm really making it all up yeah do you want to so, do you want to talk a little bit about I guess, uh, okay, you know, like uh, Eric von Daniken's work.